Um, my name is Bryce Fakefield. I'm the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Welcome to a, another uh, AIIA webinar. We have a very exciting webinar for you today on Japan-South Korea relations and what, they, what form they will take after the pandemic. Of course, these two nations are uh, partners of Australia. Australia uh, would probably like to see them get on well, as would other countries around the region, not least the United States. But there has uh, consistently been friction between these two countries. And we're going to talk about uh, whether or not the pandemic is offering us or will offer them uh, opportunities um, or otherwise um, to, to change this. Uh, and my guest today is very well placed to talk about this. Lauren Richardson is Director of Studies and Lecturer at the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy at the National University, the Australian National University, I'm sorry. She um, has lived in Korea and Japan. She was previously a Lecturer of Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh. And she has an upcoming book titled Reshaping Japan-Korea Relations, Transnational Advocacy Networks, and the Politics of Redress. And as you can tell from the title of that book, the main focus of her research uh, is uh, sub-state or, uh, or, or non-national act actors in foreign policy focusing on Japan and South Korea. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Lauren, who is here with me right now. Bryce, it's great to see you and thank you very much um, for hosting my talk tonight. I'm really delighted um, to be talking on this topic and I'm just going to share the um, PowerPoint presentation I have. Um, so yeah, thank you um, to everyone who's uh, come along tonight. I hope everyone is coping okay in these really um, tumultuous times. It's obviously very difficult. Um, so just a few words on why I chose this topic. When Bryce asked me um, what I wanted to talk about, um, I obviously chose Japan-South Korea relations, that's something I work on, um, but I don't usually sort of speculate about the future, okay? Um, so looking into the post-pandemic world, I thought it would be interesting because in my experience of studying this relationship, I've noticed that it's very susceptible um, to kind of systemic shifts. So as you know, um, Japan and South Korea relations went through what many have said is their worst period in history um, last year. Um, I mean, basically in, in the post-colonial history, one of the worst periods in decades. And that was obviously in relation to the so-called history problems um, that I'm sure you all have some um, idea of. Um, and really looking at how they eventually, I mean, how they, in the beginning, I guess, since after the colonial period when all of these events sort of happened, there was a very acrimonious period in the relationship, but what brought them together initially was the Cold War. And obviously that process was guided by the United States, who's a mutual ally, and it basically, you know, the United States encouraged them to normalize their relations, which they did. And this culminated in a treaty um, in 1965 that really served to, you know, well, attempted to kind of seal a deal um, for their history problems. But then since the end of the Cold War, we've seen a, another major shift. Um, this coincided with South Korea's democratization. And basically this major shift gave rise to a kind of host of new problems um, in the relationship, mostly centered on you know, citizens, um, individual victims of the colonial period. Um, and these issues now dominate the relationship. Um, so therefore, when this pandemic started, um, they were obviously not in, in a great place, um, still in that kind of impasse. And um, at first it seemed like, you know, this pandemic, it's just gonna cause domestic chaos, um, but it soon became apparent that it's really exacerbating um, trends in the region, like the Sino-US um, rivalry, okay, has dramatically um, increased since the pandemic started. 
And it's basically, you know, we're seeing, I don't know yet how to conceptualize this. Is it a world revolution going on? Um, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've called it for now post pandemic era. Um, I think we can all agree by now that we're kind of entering a majorly changed world. <laughs> and knowing, you know, the susceptibility of Japan Korea relations to um, these kind of systemic changes in the past, I thought it'd be good to just kind of, you know, speculate on what this change um, is going to bring. So a lot of people are calling this a kind of new Cold War. Okay, um, so the question that kind of came up for me uh, was, will this um, post-pandemic era um, promote greater convergence between Japan and South Korea, or will it lead to um, perhaps even greater divergence? Or I guess we could think about, would it just maintain the status quo of the impasse? Um, so I'm, in order to look at this, I'm going to first just you know, examine what the relationship looked like just before the pandemic, what you could say, I guess, the pre-pandemic era, um, and also how the, the kind of onset of the pandemic shaped the, the diplomatic impasse um, that they were in. And then move on to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that might present in the post-pandemic world. And I'm also going to finish by just looking at a very recent development that's happened amid the pandemic doesn't really have anything to do with structural change or the virus itself, but it could possibly be um, one of the momentous sort of developments in the relationship. I'm going to um, strictly keep my time to 20 minutes. So um, it's a short presentation. Um, I want to allow plenty of time for questions and answers. So feel free to send them through as we go. I thought I'll just treat this topic fairly broadly um, and I'll be guided by the questions with what we um, should go into in more detail. Um, so firstly, as you all know, um, prior to the pandemic, um, especially last year, Japan and South Korea relations hit a kind of historic low um, since the um, pre-colonial period. Um, there were a lot, lot of things going on. Um, obviously, you, I'm sure if you're following the news, you'd know that um, there were a few developments in relation to the history problems, mostly judicial developments that occurred um, in the domestic context of South Korea. Um, and these were basically in relation to the, the labor issue, the Korean laborers who were mobilized um, to serve under Japanese colonialism. Um, and this came on top of the dissolution of the Comfort Women Accord um, that was um, enacted in 2015. Um, so these developments really set off a chain of events um, that saw, you know, the, the history problems kind of contaminate other realms of the relationship to an extent that we haven't seen in a long time. So, you know, it, it gave rise to a trade dispute um, where uh, South Korea was downgraded in Japan's um, again, list of preferential, preferred trade partners and South Korea then reciprocated this. And then um, there was talk on the South Korean side of, um, breaking off a intelligence sharing agreement after much um, toing and froing that sort of managed to hold. Um, so what was going on in this dispute and what really precipitated it? I'm just going to try to focus on the broad picture that in South Korea over, I would say since the end of the Cold War, there's been, and since the, the democratization of South Korea, there has been a kind of um, battle going on between state and society domestically where citizens um, who were you know now classed as victims um, special categories of victims from the colonial period have been trying to i guess undermine the treaty the normalization treaty especially the the settlement pertaining um, to victims and they've been trying to settle these issues with japan on their own terms and for a long time, you know, for the past few years, successive administrations in Japan and South Korea have tried to find ways to address those victims' claims by not undermining the treaty, working around the treaty. Um, they've come up with various, you know, proposals and plans and policies, some of which have, you know, um, been enacted, um, but they've often been deemed unsatisfactory by the victims. Um, so with, 
um, the advent of the President Moon administration, um, as I said, he dissolved um, Comfort Women Accord and his administration has also coincided with Supreme Court rulings on the Korean labor issue, um, which were very shocking um, to Japan. They basically kind of directly undermine the treaty. So President Moon, as you know, the context that he came to power was um, the, his predecessor had obviously been uh, dramatically impeached and there was a real democratic deficit in South Korea that he wanted to rectify. He also had um, a background in human rights. He'd been a human rights lawyer and had even been um, involved in representing the laborers um, in court. And so he was kind of, I guess, the first president who wanted to really converge completely with the perspective of the victims. And so he was willing to, you know, say that the way we've dealt with the comfort women issue, that um, state to state accord of 2015 was unsatisfactory. We're going to dissolve that. Um, we're also going to, you know, follow the court rulings um, on Korean labor. And this was met with a lot of, I guess, dismay on the Japan side. Um, the context of Japan's reaction was this Comfort Women Accord was a huge step um, for Prime Minister Abe, because if you look at his original position when he came to power, um, which was, you know, we're considering taking back, you know, one of our historic apologies to the Comfort Women, um, and to then take this huge step of enacting um, a state-to-state -state accord, for him, that was a kind of yeah dramatic um, gesture, and to see it dissolved immediately started to erode the the trust between the two. And then when it came to the labor ruling, because the labor issue was one issue that was expressly negotiated in 1965 when when the treaty was signed, it looked like um, from Japan's perspective that the whole logic of the relationship, which is built on this treaty, is being overturned. And Japan kind of read the labor rulings as a political act um, in relation to the appointment of the judges by Moon and also by the fact that um, President Moon had been involved in that issue and that these rulings reflect his personal stance on the issue. Um, so that sort of gave rise to a logic in Japan that, you know, the President Moon administration is undermining the treaty. Um, and therefore, you know, there's nothing much we can do except wait out this administration and hope for the best in the next one. Um, so what you can see from this, this whole dispute or this diplomatic impasse is that at the front and center of Japan's um, foreign policy toward North, South Korea on the history problems is the 1965 treaty. Okay, Japan stands by that. Um, only is willing to work around it, but doesn't want to sort of throw it out because in Japan's mind, if we undermine that treaty, that opens the floodgates to, you know, rewriting every settlement we've ever made on the colonial period. But in South Korea, um, they recognize that even though there's been all these um, treaties and um, policies and accords, we still have a lot of victims who are fallen through the cracks and who are not satisfied and who didn't necessarily receive any money, maybe they didn't qualify at the time, and this treaty was signed under an authoritarian government and therefore it doesn't hold. Um, so what we see is a really serious diplomatic impasse um, with both sides being extremely firm on their position um, and being total sort of loggerheads um, with one another, with no point, and I think, um, what we also saw was just an exhaustion of political will, you know, that we've done enough already, that was Japan's position. We're not even willing to, you know, discuss these matters any further. But South Korea obviously faced the conundrum of how do we deal with, you know, this ongoing um, problem that our, um, the victims are still protesting, still filing lawsuits, um, and it's ongoing. So things, were in free fall for a long time with this trade dispute mounting as a, as a result of that. And then the intelligence, um, bilateral intelligence part looked like, looking like it was going to fall through. But eventually the two governments did apparently um, put the brakes on things, okay, where they stopped that, that kind of free fall. 
um, President Moon decided, okay, we're going to stick with the intelligence sharing of PAC for now. And there were also some other just small, minor um, kind of positive developments that made people think, you know, have they moved past this? You know, are they okay now? What, where is this relationship? Is, is it coming back? And that's when the, the is it recovering? And that's when the um, pandemic started. And at first, as you all know, Japan and South Korea were both hit pretty badly with the pandemic early on. First Japan with the Diamond Princess um, cruise fiasco, and then South Korea had a major cluster outbreak. And at the time, you know, President Moon was saying this might be a good opportunity um, to cooperate with one another. Um, but things kind of went downhill um, when Japan imposed a travel ban um, on its citizens going to South Korea. That was at a time when quite a few countries were doing the same and South Korea still kind of, you know, highly sensitized to moves by Japan, um, responded under the principle of reciprocity by um, slapping a ban straight back on Japan. Um, so it was, became clear that nothing has really changed, um, that impasse is still there. Um, both sides are, you know, highly sensitized um, to moves by one another. And then things, I guess, since, you know, the pandemic has gained traction, obviously both countries have, you know, made a lot of progress. South Korea has become a kind of international model in dealing with pandemics. And Japan, on the other hand, has, um, we still don't know what that model is, but it's appearing to um, work. And <laughs> we're going to obviously, um, see how that's how that's going to pan out later. Um, so I'm not really going to focus on how the domestic how the pandemic actually hit each country um, domestically, but we can see um, from from this there are some positive signs that have come out with both countries agreeing that maybe we can um, you know help each other. Well, early on in the pandemic, they did sort of cooperate with. Um, allowing their citizens to move between, um, repatriating their citizens from each other's country. Um, and they seem to have put the brakes on these major problems. Um, South Korea is still obviously demanding that Japan upgrade it again on its trade, preferential trade partners list. And that's still in the, in, that's still pending that decision. Um, but so far there haven't been any major moves, but at the same time, we can't really say there's been any progress. They, the two countries still are at um, a diplomatic impasse. Um, so just moving on quickly, what kind of opportunities are going to emerge in this post-pandemic world as we are now already coming out of it? Well, at least some countries are, including Japan and South Korea. I actually think my argument, um, just to sort of preview it or sum it up, is that there'll be more incentives for convergence um, than divergence um, in this post-pandemic world. So one of those is, of course, you know, the economic damage um, in both countries, also in the region, um, I think will incentivize them to move back toward more of a two-track approach where they separate um, their history problems from their economic relationship and actually do make the moves to improve, um, I guess, their trade relations again. And that's because if you look at the pre-pandemic period, the kind of mood I saw on both sides, I mean, there were all these economists putting out analysis showing exactly what the economic damage is of, you know, um, the trade dispute and also the boycott in South Korea that South Korean citizens launched against Japan. And, but at the time, you know, both governments were kind of like, well, you know, that economic cost doesn't matter as much as the principle um, of the diplomatic dispute or their diplomatic positions, you know, so there was almost a sense of, you know, we don't care what the economic damage is, but I'm sure that's going to, that sort of equation is going to change um, moving into the, the post-pandemic world when Japan is already moving into recession like many other countries. There will be stronger incentives to, yes, separate the history problems from the economics. Also, the, the deepening Sino-US rivalry, I think it's become clear that that's only going to become 
even worse um, in coming weeks and coming months. And this is extremely problematic for Japan and South Korea um, for another a number of reasons. And I think it will promote convergence. So if you look at, I mean, pre-pandemic, both countries, obviously, they're both allies of the United States. South Korea is having quite a lot of issues with the US and its alliance over cost sharing negotiations. And, you know, they're, they're still ongoing. And so the US has also caused, I guess, a lot of concerns for both countries with its, you know, rapidly um, declining power and influence, which is only, again, being hastened by the pandemic. And, as um, kind of Victor Char and other scholars have, have mentioned in the past, you know, when the US kind of withdraws its commitment, um, Japan and South Korea are incentivized to cooperate um, more. And so at the same time, pre-pandemic, I think both countries with having all of these disputes over history, they both kind of prefer dealing with China than one another. Um, and that's because it I guess from South Korea's perspective, there's a lot less baggage um, there. And even with Japan, I mean, and China, um, even though they have different political systems, they also have history disputes. Those history disputes um, concerning victims, the same ones that, that are we see with South Korea, they're controlled, okay? Um, you don't see Chinese couple women for laborers putting up statues or launching lawsuits against the Japanese government, um, staging protests outside the embassy in Beijing. So I think from Japan's perspective, you know, that sort of reached the conclusion that China is just easier to deal with. Let's focus our attention on China. Um, but obviously that's becoming pretty problematic um, as we see the virus, you know, emanated um, from China and its trade um, was cut off for a while. It became problematic, I think, um, of their dependence on China. And I think because of China's ability to control those history problems, it gives Japan a sense that maybe we're a little more like-minded, you know, with China or we're not like-minded with South Korea because we can't meet eye to eye on this treaty, the normalization treaty. But once, you know, seeing this crisis unfold um, and what's happening between China and Hong Kong, China and Taiwan, democracy coming under threat in the region, will again sort of push Japan and South Korea to realize their common values um, for liberal democracy. Um, so I think that what I'm saying is, yeah, the, this kind of new Cold War, whatever you want to call it, is likely to have you know, to incentivize convergence in the way it has in the past, but for different reasons. Obviously, South Korea is now a democracy. It's not the South Korea um, it was before. And I think this convergence will not be led by the US as much as it was. Um, convergence, but more one where Japan and South Korea are kind of forced to you know, recognize a new logic um, to the relationship, one that's going to be important in helping to rebuild the economy of the region and to defend the so-called um, rules-based order. There's also a lot of um, potential for Japan and South Korea to cooperate with Australia um, in the region. And I mean, I'm not just saying this because we're, you know, um, I'm Australian, I, I'm here giving a presentation in Australia, um, but I think it, yeah, it's pretty obvious in this pandemic, um, the similarities between Japan, South Korea and Australia are becoming more, pan, uh, are becoming more apparent. And obviously, it also, also seems like right now that Japan and South Korea both have more in common with Australia than with the US. And this is becoming more apparent, this, this trend, un, since the advent of the Trump administration, where we've seen both Japan and South Korea pushing harder to strengthen their relations with Australia, both security and economic. And this is a reciprocal process. Um, so far, it hasn't really converged, you know, in the trilateral realm, but there's a lot of potential for that, um, particularly in the hydrogen economy. Um, with both Japan and South Korea and Australia 
seeking to um, you know really develop their, their hydrogen economies and both looking at Australia as a potential producer um, of hydrogen to fuel those economies. Um, so I think that, yeah, all of these um, factors are going to sort of make an environment that's conducive for Japan and South Korea to cooperate. Because if we look in history, like um, they have, the way these systemic changes or structural changes have promoted cooperation is by, I guess, forcing the two countries to kind of separate um, history from other problems, but also incentivizing them to not, you know, engage in policies that will upset the diplomatic relationship. So almost kind of prioritizing the diplomatic relationship over, um, you know, domestic opinion. And lastly, what are some of the ongoing challenges though that they're likely to have? Um, I think this fundamental impasse of the 1965 treaty um, is something that's not going to um, disappear in the near future. And as long as there continues to be victim lawsuits, that treaty will be continued, um, will continue to be challenged. But I think what's become obvious is that the, the South Korea that Japan signed this treaty with is not the, the South Korea of today. And that, that treaty, I mean, Japan, as I said before, for them, the, the treaty is still front and center of their diplomacy toward um, South Korea on history problems. But South Korea is looking at that treaty increasingly um, with skeptical eyes. Um, so there, there will need to be some effort, I think, on both sides to find a new logic um, to cooperate. Um, but I don't think, I also think that this convergence that I'm talking about, it may not happen immediately, um, may not even happen under the two current administrations. I think there's, there's still, it's probably going to be exhausted political will on both sides. There's a lot of water under the bridge um, because of the, the comfort women issue and the, the labor issue and um, so forth. So it may be, um, I guess, the next administration. I know that in Japan, there's a sense that or, you know, if Korea changes party or even just changes leadership, you know, we may be able to move back to where we were. But I don't actually think that these changes that have affected the relationship are actually connected to the Moon administration. I think we can trace them back to 2011, Emil Bak administration, when the former comfort women filed a lawsuit against its own government in the constitutional court. And it's actually then, okay, so that was the conservative government in South Korea, and that caused Pres um, wow. President Im Young Bak to really start pushing Japan hard on the history problems, and the relationship deteriorated sharply from there. It only briefly recovered in 2015 and has gone down again. So I don't see um, the judiciary kind of changing its position on these issues. And the last challenge is, I think this di policy divergence the two countries have on North Korea is likely to stay for quite a while. As we all know, Japan is kind of at an impasse um, with North Korea. They haven't engaged in this summitry. Um, that's a whole different kettle of um, fish, which I won't go into now. Um, but with South Korea, um, despite the stalled denuclearization negotiations, they're still very much pursuing um, relationship with North Korea and using a lot of their political um, capital on that issue. So the last thing I want to mention is just obviously there's been a huge domestic um, scandal um, in relation to the comfort women issue in South Korea in past weeks and I think this is obviously probably more <laughs> momentous than any of these structural changes I'm talking about, because as everyone knows, this issue has been the major thorn in the relationship. Um, it's really, you know, bigger than anything else. And it's been the most persistent issue. Um, you know, we see weekly protests outside the Japanese embassy in Seoul. Um, and so what's happened, just briefly for anyone who's, who's not following um, this controversy, is that the Comfort Women have been represented in South Korea by an advocacy organization. Um, the short name is the Korean Council. Um, ever since this issue emerged, this was actually the group that coaxed the Comfort Women forward and 
um, set the demands um, from, for Japan um, to resolve this issue. And they're a group that has immense political power and more so than the Korean government in controlling this issue and even more so than the victims. And um, there's always been issues uh, surrounding their representation of the victims because none of the leaders of this group have been victims, okay? They're just advocates. And there's also been a lot of accusations from the victims over years. Um, no one's ever really paid attention to these and it's partly because this group has, um, it has a great deal of moral authority um, to sort of act as gatekeepers of the victims because they were the first ones to pay attention to the victims and to show them sympathy and support. They've also done a really good job in, you know, attracting sympathy and support from the public um, in South Korea. Um, but in a, a kind of momentous um, development um, in recent weeks, the, one of the former leaders from this group, Yun mi um, who you can see on the right in the picture, has recently been elected um, as a lawmaker in the ruling um, party, or she's affiliated with the ruling party. And she's been accused by one of the prominent former comfort women of um, misappropriating the funds, the donations, and also not rep representing the victims well, and all kinds of things. And so there's been two press conferences launched by former comfort women, and she's made some stunning accusations, none of which are new. Um, I should say I've, I've heard the same sort of things from victims um, that I've interviewed um, myself. But the reason they're getting so much attention this time is because um, Yoon mi Hyung is now um, a politician and so she can be kind of held accountable. So this group is now being, um, there's a prosecution case against this group and they're being investigated at the moment. Um, the reason I think this is important and you know, what, what does it mean for the relationship between Japan and, and South Korea? I think that, you know, for many years, ever since this issue emerged, the South Korean government hasn't been able to take proper leadership on this issue because this group holds a lot of the power. And it means that whenever Japan and South Korea have made a deal uh, with one another, um, of course, the two governments have the power to enact those deals, but it's always been the Korean Council that decides whether those deals will be implemented well or not. And they've always decided, no, they won't. Um, and there's been, of course, some of the victims support their view, but others don't. And the ones who don't have had no voice. Um, so what's, I guess, momentous about this is that the, the South Korean government may be able to sort of extricate the voices from the victims and this group. And I think this is going to have to be a domestic process. I don't think Japan will be involved, um, obviously, first. And some of the claims from this victim are that the 2015 deal, you know, we weren't given proper information about it. Um, and also, um, we shouldn't be holding these protests outside the Japanese embassy. They're just perpetuating problems. Um, and she's in proposing um, to boycott those demonstrations, and so were some of the other victims. So what we've seen is a major rift in the comfort women movement. Um, I really think this is going to lead to a lot of domestic reckoning in South Korea. But ultimately, it's going to really change the way that the South Korean government approaches Japan with this issue and how the Comfort Women Accord of 2015 is reflected upon. Um, I think the best way to move forward, and I'll end with this, is for the South Korean government to set up a task force, which they've done before, um, and really just conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with the surviving victims, trying to get their stories straight, their individual stories, um, to separate those from the voice of the Korean Council, regardless of what the, the outcome of this prosecution is. I think there's been enough claims um, to warrant a very serious investigation. And, you know, to use those individual um, voices to try and, as a basis for policy or for reflecting on this issue or dealing with the issue from Japan. So what this whole controversy revealed is that this utter confusion between Japan and South Korea in relation to what actor we should be resolving this issue with. Okay, it's, 
the, the victims, Japan has tried to solve it with the victims, with the Asian Women's Fund. That didn't work because the Korean Council blocked it. Um, then they tried to solve it with the Korean government. That didn't work. The Korean Council blocked it. Um, now the Korean Council has been, you know, their credibility has been severely undermined. I don't know how they're, they're going to recover um, from this. So it, it may provide some breakthrough just for dealing with this issue. I don't think Japan's going to offer anything more in terms of funds or money or policies, but it may just really ease the tension of the major issue that's been undermining um, this relationship for a long time. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Right. Well, thanks, uh, Lauren, for a very comprehensive uh, uh, talk on um, what is obviously a very difficult issue. Um, there have been a number of questions already. Uh, we have a number of questions along a similar theme, um, both uh, uh, both of the most popular, oh, no, not, not anymore, but, um, but some of the more popular questions have been asked by uh, uh, Yoichiro Sato, who is, of course, uh, our guest from last week. He's the professor uh, at uh, Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University and a former dean of uh, international research. Uh, we have a question from Ricky Kirsten, who is dean of arts at Murdoch University. What a learned bunch we have. Um, the, the line of their questioning um, is on um, international alliances and positioning vis-a-vis -vis, um, China and North Korea, and um, it's asking whether uh, whether or not there's a kind of trilateralizing logic uh, to uh, North Korea, uh, sorry, to ROK, Japan, uh, US relations, uh, whether or not we're going to see a, a bilateral sort of uh, reordering of power, um, and whether these three countries uh, will choose to uh, cooperate again against maybe a China-North Korea axis or perhaps a, uh, a time when fears about North Korea will drive the two countries together. Do you see this happening at all? Yeah, I think there is a trilateralizing logic, but not so much in the sense of US are okay, Japan. Um, so the reason I talked about potentials for trilateral cooperation with Australia is that I have been involved um, in a project um, on this topic with scholars from Japan and South Korea. And we're looking at potentials to trilateralize the relationship with Australia, um, ASEAN, and also India. And the reason that I think the US are okay um, Japan um, sort of trilateral access that we saw through the Cold War um, as being, you know, a pretty strong um, relationship will not be, be that important moving into this, this new sort of era that we're in is because, again, it is based on a real Cold War logic where North Korea is a threat, Russia is a threat. Um, it was really formed as a balance against the triangle between China, North Korea and Russia, okay? And that's not really a very strong trilateral relationship anymore. Also, that trilateral relationship is, is really based on the logic of defence cooperation. And even though there are still some promising signs that Japan and South Korea's defence relations are intact and will remain you know, just barely intact. That's really the weakest link of the relationship. Obviously, when you've got a trust deficit, you don't want So that's why I think partners like Australia, you know, even ASEAN, India may become more important in the, the trilateral um, realm for um, Japan and South Korea because they do help them to move towards a new logic, a new post-war logic, post-Cold War logic, one that's not based on their 1965 treaty and realise that they actually do have other things in common, like, you know, defending the rules-based order, not in a heavy kind of defence sense, but in promoting, you know, um, democratic values um, in the region, things like that. 
Uh, well, it's great that you do mention um, multilateral fora like that because we do have a question from Zara Kempton, uh, who, as usual, is with us. Hello, Zara, uh, our National Vice President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. She, um, she does wonder if there are opportunities uh, for uh, Korea and Japan to work together in multinational fora. Now, you have just answered that to some extent, mm -hmm. but are there any other opportunities that you see there? Yeah, I mean, I even just saw an article today, which sounded good. I think it was coming from intellectuals and government officials have put forward um, a sort of proposal. I like the, the term they use, um, a coalition of the competent, you know, to sort of deal with economic reconstruction um, in um, the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific. Um, they included in that Japan and South Korea and Australia. So you see these three countries are kind of being included in all these fora but also India and China even. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that excludes China. Um, but yeah, certainly it's becoming really apparent through this pandemic, you know, which countries have similar governance mechanisms and, and also capacity um, to deal with these things. Another sort of trilateral agenda I talk about in my project, um, still not sure how keen South Korea would be like in this, is for Japan, Australia and South Korea to cooperate on capacity building in the Pacific Islands. Obviously, South Korea is pretty um, committed with dealing with North Korea and they don't have, but I mean, they have had some interest in that, that region. Um, but obviously, because the Pacific Islands are being really heavily hit economically by this pandemic, they'll also be extremely vulnerable um, to Chinese influence um, after the pandemic. And I think we democracy in the region and you know increasing Chinese influence I think that's another realm um, that they could maybe work together in. Great that's uh, that's fantastic um, you're still with us good all right so we have um, we have a question here from Tom Corbin and it does relate to something that you did so you talked about the uh, trilateral relationship between the ROK Japan and Australia as being a forum for cooperation. Uh, Corbin who is from the Pacific Forum I don't know if he's sitting in Honolulu at the moment I hope so um, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, has, has asked whether um, there is possibility for friction within this trilateral relationship. So Australia has been very keen on forging relationships with Japan, and it's been particularly supportive of Japan's quote unquote normalization, um, remilitarization, I guess, if you're a left-wing Japanese person. Um, would um, a closer relationship between Japan and Australia cause friction between Australia and the ROK? Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's a really good question. It's something I discuss in my chapter, albeit briefly, that it's always been the case. I mean, I think one of the reasons, one of the sort of mystery in the Indo-Pacific Korea relations are not as developed as you would expect. You know, we have a lot in common. Um, yes, certainly under the Trump administration, there is a push towards that. And I really think the reason for that, a huge part of it, is that, you know, South Korea does have these misgivings about how close we are to Japan, especially in the defense realm, increasingly. And it has had a slight zero sum effect for some time. But I think that's changing. I think, um, it has been the the sort of you know unreliability of the US that's becoming increasingly apparent under the Trump administration that is kind of pushing South Korea to really search for other you know like-minded partners and Australia is obviously one of the major ones there and probably also the tensions they've had with Japan is pushing that um, so that's why I'm kind of thinking that defense cooperation is not the best sort of trilateral agenda. Um, I think they have a lot of other things in common, like both pushing really, all three are pushing very hard on this development of hydrogen, um, energy technology and things like that. So I think it's something that they will be able to um, move past, but it's probably going to take time to really keep building the trust there.
Thanks uh, for that answer. We have, um, I'm just quickly reading one. Um, I saw that there was a, a question on hydrogen down here, so I wanted to link it to your last answer, but it's from Christopher Skinner, who is a member with our New South Wales branch. He's asked, with respect to Australia as a hydrogen producer, would ROK and perhaps also Japan be inclined to contribute technologies such as nuclear power to assist in the making uh, in making the trade economically attractive? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, there's already been a lot of deals signed bilaterally, a lot of memorandums of understandings signed between Japan and Australia and also Japan and South Korea um, on the hydrogen economy since like late last year. And even today, there's still news about it that South Korea is considering Australia as a base, you know, for producing these things. So I think the nature of the cooperation is obviously partly in production. They're looking at Australia as a producer, but at the same time, there's bilateral um, um, deals signed on just looking into the development of technology and sharing um, know-how on that. So obviously, if you were to recast that in a trilateral um, setting, they would obviously have a very synergistic effect. And I think that would be something that perhaps Australia could mediate. I don't think Australia has a place in mediating history problems. I've never thought that, but certainly have a place in coordinating trilateral activities. Um, and Scott Morrison actually came out with a quote late last year in the, in the context of talking about this energy um, development in the bilateral settings with Japan and South Korea. And he said, you know, Japan and the Indo-Pacific is stronger with South Korea and Japan getting along. So he was kind of almost, you know, saying that we want to coordinate this relationship. That was the sense I got from his Lowy Institute speech. Okay, great. Um, now your talk is, of course, on uh, post-pandemic relations, um, and you have touched on how the pandemic will affect things in terms of uh, uh, creating the space for economic cooperation. But we do have a question here from Lillian, uh, who asks about specific cooperation on COVID. Does COVID create a space uh, where the two countries can cooperate? There was uh, for example, a suggestion that South Korea might help Japan by providing uh, masks or other PPE, I think, um, or or help with help with the general situation. Um, the the sort of mask diplomacy is there a space for the two countries to cooperate on that? Yeah, I don't know about mask diplomacy because both countries, you know, tend to stock a lot of masks as it is it's kind of a wearing mask is, is already like a huge part of the culture um i think there is a space um the space i don't know if they their model of dealing with covid is covid 19 seems to be pretty different i think what could have a really positive effect i've seen a few articles in the last few days talking about japan is willing to open its borders to these few countries and one of them is south korea i believe i think those sort of moves could have a really positive effect if they can create their own version of a trans tasman bubble maybe we could make a trans indo-pacific bubble um <laughs> can travel around but yeah i guess cooperation yeah, it, it could be difficult. I think sometimes there's a sensitivity, especially I've seen it in South Korea, we don't need help from Japan in dealing with this. I don't know if it's still that post-colonial sort of um, sentiment, um, but yeah, I'm sure they're gonna find ways um, to cooperate, whether it, it might not be expressly on treating the pandemic or the virus, but certainly rebuilding the um, regional economy and promoting trade, things like that, I think would be more feasible. Right, we have um, uh, a couple of uh, questions now that are, are related, really, I think, to war memory. Um, the first one, overtly so, I mean, if you, if you, you know, countries have had frictions before related to atrocities that have perpetrated on each other or that one has perpetrated on the other, and they have emerged from um from those relationships and built built relations of friendship and um zara kimpton again 
uh, refers in particular to the obvious uh, example of Germany. Uh, you know, Germany now gets on with its neighbors, where it, whereas it didn't for a long time, but managed to build those um, relationships of trust. Um, what is stopping um, Japan from? Uh, what is stopping Japan and Korea from 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 working on these these very acrimonious historical problems? The second uh, question that I have is one that's been burning up the Q and A feed on uh, youth, and it is from Erin. Um, the younger generation, is this a generational issue, right? Most people do think about war memory in generational terms. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I did focus on Japan a lot in my career and looked at war memory. And a lot of people always used to say, well, issues like Article 9, the peace clause would die out after, um, with a, when a new generation came along. Would the same thing happen in South Korea? When, when there is a turning of the generations, if you like, um, Will we see this issue die down or will it for some reason, and what is that reason, linger on even after those who are directly affected have passed on? Okay, great, um, great questions. Thank you. So, um, yeah, you often do hear those um, comparisons between Japan and Germany. Um, I've personally not really engaged in those comparisons because I think it makes a lot more sense to, if you want to compare, to compare colonial relationships. Because really, you know, what's at the heart of a lot of the acrimony we see in Korea, um, South Korea, and also North Korea toward Japan, is related to the colonial, you know, power dynamic. And, you know, that kind of stamping out of Korean culture and trampling on that. And um, if you look into that literature that compares different colonial responses, because obviously Taiwan had a very different response to colonialism than South Korea. Um, there's a great, you know, literature on this, um, some of it by Bruce Cummings. And I find it really interesting that he explains that, you know, um, if we want to understand why post-colonial resentment sort of lingers and why it's much stronger in one country than another, we need to look firstly at the pre-colonial period. Did that country have a strong sense of, you know, kind of, I guess, having, being a nation or, you know, having its own culture already or, you know, speaking a, you know, did it have one language that it spoke and those kind of factors matter um, a lot. Um, it makes colonialism a lot more painful. Um, secondly, we have to look at the, the kind of policies that happened under the colonial period. And these are very different than occupation policies, which is often what we're looking at in terms of, you know, Germany when we look at its post-occupation um, relations. Um, obviously, they were pretty severe in South Korea compared to, like, Taiwan. And then we also have to look at the post-colonial period, okay? Um, did the country that was colonized still regard the colonizer as the main enemy? And that was the case for both South Korea and Japan, even though they, I mean, South Korea and North Korea, even though they engaged in a kind of civil war with each other, they still regarded Japan as the enemy. Whereas for Taiwan, you know, it was China suddenly became a problem. So there's a lot of factors that explains why, you know, a colonial experience can be extremely bad for one country. And also what matters is democratization. Do they democratize later? Because as I said before, that brings a lot of new actors into the problem. That hasn't really happened with China. So in South Korea, you have the victims, you have the advocates, you have the judiciary, you have the South Korean government of all these actors. Um, whereas with Germany, you know, yeah, there was a different post-war context. Obviously, you know, the US policy really guided reconciliation. Um, it occupied, you know, obviously Germany and, and Japan. And in the case of Germany, the US wanted a multilateral security arrangement, NATO, so that got Germany having to socialize with all those countries that it had wronged. Whereas in the context of Asia, you know, the US wanted a hub and spoke system, um, sort of inoculated Japan from dealing with a lot of those issues. And, you know, the US also made a lot of terrible policy mistakes. Um, it could have helped to resolve those issues between Japan and South Korea, but it didn't really care very much about the Korean victims. And the second question, generational, um, yeah, this is a really, 
important question. I think definitely we see a difference in the second generation. Obviously the first generation in, in South Korea have a lot of raw feelings, a lot of anger, and there's also a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment. But with the younger generation, it's more like, you know, they're very highly educated, they've studied often um so know a lot about them and they also have direct family members who may have you know had a, a brutal time under colonialism so they certainly care um a lot and because south korea has gone through a lot of change um as they came of age and went to universities democratizing they also have a very strong sense of justice and i think that's one of the issues that's um, one of my supervisors in South Korea, he used to talk about the reason Japan and South Korea can't reconcile over these issues is they have a, a completely different conception of justice. And he said that in Japan's case, it's very formalistic based on treaties and, you know, um, whatever, tribunals, international law. South Korea's case, it's like, yeah, you know, we have that, but we still don't, you know, we still need an apology or we still need this, you know, those formal arrangements, you know, aren't so important when we still have aggrieved people, you know, so that's kind of like they're not even on the same page with justice. And in terms of the comfort women protests, yeah, we see much younger generation in recent years attending those protests. It used to just be more elderly people. So certainly younger people have gotten, you know, on board. I don't know what's going to happen though with this scandal because, um, if the comfort women victims are boycotting those protests, it's going to be a little bit strange for, you know, South Koreans to be out there protesting without them. So I actually think it's going to cause great confusion in South Korea. You know, they're going to be thinking, who do we support in this issue? And I think it's an important time to bring it back to the victims. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion in South Korea about whether the public as well as the, the public should have a say in what's okay for the victims and what's not. Um, so yeah, I think these issues will, will still, you know, continue in some form, but it doesn't mean that, you know, Japan and South Korea can't have a productive relationship um, at the same time as trying to manage these. <clears throat> okay, time for one more very quick question. Um, uh, and, and it is related to the last point you make, so I will ask it. Um, uh, to what extent is this reliant on the leaders? We know that Abe Shinzo um, uh, and uh, Park Young hae if they didn't get on, they at least found some kind of accommodation that they could they could uh, knock out a deal. Um, uh, to what extent is the current friction um, dependent on the leadership of Abe Shinzo, who, let's remember, has uh, limited time left, I guess, and um, Moon Jae-un, who, of course, has a fixed term and, uh, and, and not much time either. So uh, uh, do you see, do you see this, this issue as changing with um, the leadership in South Korea and Japan? Yeah, to be honest, I don't think the leadership is the main variable. A lot of people... the reason it's not a major variable is because both governments um, and I think this has been a mistake um, have entrusted these issues to a great extent to their respective judiciaries right so they tend to be led more by judicial developments um, than by leadership you know, to be honest, of course, each leader has their, their own view. Um, and to support this argument, if you look at, I think, like I said before, in Japan, there seems to be an assumption at the moment that, oh, once President Moon's um, term is finished, we can get back to normal. This is just President Moon, but it's not. Because if you look at the, as I mentioned, the 2011 Comfort Women Constitutional Court ruling, the leader was Im Young Bak, who was the more conservative party, who tends to be, you know, maybe a bit more, um, I guess, <laughs> may, I guess, preference the diplomatic relationship, you know, um, more than public opinion um, sometimes. And at the same time, his counterpart in Japan was also from the opposition party to the LDP, the Democratic Party, and that was um, Noda. 
And so you would think that that's the ideal sort of setting because that party tends to be more sympathetic on these issues to, to South Korea. But it was disastrous because of the court ruling. And suddenly Im Myung Bak was bringing up the issue of comfort women in the summit meetings when it wasn't even on the agenda and, and Noto getting very upset and angry and walking out. And, you know, that led to a downward spiral of relations. So I think what's missing from these issues and what needs to return, it's not change of leadership, but it's like, you know, bringing back diplomacy. It's obviously going to take a kind of Herculean diplomatic effort to, you know, manage these issues, but that's really what's been missing. It's like, let the judiciaries decide and then we'll deal with the rulings which is really tricky <laughs> because then they don't, Japan doesn't like the, the rulings in South Korea. Um, so yeah, I think the only difference will be when there's a new leadership, there may be more political will, you know, because they're fresh in the position. And that's often the case. Most South Korean leaders have started off at least saying, we're going to look forward on this history problem. So I think just, yeah, what they need is someone who doesn't come in with a lot of baggage, like the two current leaders, wanting to take any big steps okay great and we are just one minute over time now so um i shall quickly wrap up thank you very much lauren that was a fantastic presentation i really enjoyed it um, and thank you at uh at home for watching yep um Lauren, do you? <laughs> yeah, thank you all for um, firstly for attending um, and for the really stimulating questions. They're, they're great. I'm sorry I couldn't answer them all, but if you want to email me and get in, we can get in a discussion that way. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone's okay. There's a lot going on in the world at the moment and looking forward to meeting you on the other side. I hope we can go back to Japan and South Korea soon. Yeah, that, that Indo-Pacific bubble sounds really good. But, you know, we have to be safe and yeah, cautious yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who are still with us, and most of you are, I'm, I'm pleased to say, uh, please do um, stick around with us longer. Um, next week we have, if you're interested in East Asian issues, next week in the morning on Wednesday, um, we have an event on um, Japan's pork barrel politics or Japan's domestic political system and how that relates to money. Um, that's with Amy Katalinak and it's in the morning because she's based in New York. Uh, she's at New York University so we have to pull that one off in, at, at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, coming up, uh, it's actually registered on the website as the 12th of June but I'm afraid the date is going to have to change to the 22nd. We have a lecture by Remco Broker, who many of you will have seen on the recent Four Corners uh, documentary on Monday on um, what, what's called Bureau 39, the, the secret office or the office, it's not so secret anymore now that there's a documentary, um, which uh, manages uh, uh, North Korea's um, international financial um, web. So some great events coming up. Um, please do take a look at internationalaffairs.org.au slash events. Um, and you'll see that we have, we probably have about 15 or 16 uh, more events scheduled. So look at those events, pick the ones you like and uh, come on in. It's been fantastic having you and good night.